we have Eric Baskin, um, who is chair of the British Self-Defence Governing Body. Um, Mr. Baskin is a senior lecturer in law in Liverpool John Lewis University. He's also a self-defence expert, chairman and director of training and examiners of the British Self-Defence Governing Body, the BSDGB, um, which has provided training to the public and private sector, I think, yeah. in relation to uh, self-defence control, restraint and confrontation management. Um, I think Mr. Baskin himself has experienced in control and restraint technique, defensive tactics and physical intervention systems used by the police, social services, the NHS, secure hospitals, secure children's homes and schools. Has given advice um, to all who reasonably have asked for it, including my inquiry five years ago. Um, he's a member of the European Violence in Psychiatry Research Group, and you may be unsurprised to learn from that that Mr. Baskin is a martial arts practitioner, instructor, referee, and examiner. You're a sort of defense polymath, aren't you really, sir? So we welcome you and would ask you to give us your introduction and then, once again, I shall ask some questions if you may. Well, thank you for inviting me to the inquiry. One of the biggest difficulties in this area, in the use of force, is that a large number of the techniques that are used, particularly in the area of children and young adult institutions, is that the techniques themselves are not designed, were not designed, for the use of on children or young adults. Some of them have been adapted, in many cases very poorly adapted uh, for use uh, in uh, association with children and young adults. And a lot of the training is pretty poor as well. A lot of this comes from, as we all know, from the prison service. Uh, a totally different sort of audience um, and the techniques necessarily that need to be different. One of the biggest problems with that is the use of physical restraint will be poorly applied. And what that means is that in many cases, unnecessarily, pain will be used in order to secure compliance. If techniques were designed, and there are many, many techniques that can and ought to be introduced, then pain compliant techniques won't be necessary. Certainly won't be necessary to the extent uh, that they're being uh, used now. Another great problem is the realisation that all physical restraints should be used as a last resort, and that's something that is, well, it's said everywhere. But my fear is that it's really people just pay lip service to that. People say, well, we'll use physical restraint, we'll use these intervention skills as a last resort, but in so many cases, they're used almost as a first uh, port of call. And that must be a breach of the rules, a breach of the regulations. One of the other difficulties is that with the uh, poor quality, with many of the physical intervention and restraint techniques, a lot more people are going to be injured. Uh, that's going to be the uh, children, not necessarily the child itself, but many of the children who might be there, both uh, physically, if they're involved in the incident themselves, uh, or psychologically or, or emotionally. And the use of restraint, not necessarily involving pain, but the use of restraint is happening far too frequently. Another issue, of course, is, we've heard it from the previous speakers today, the question of pain compliant techniques. Should it be allowed? Should it be prohibited? In my view, it is that there should be a general prohibition of pain compliant techniques with regard to children and young adults. But that should be a, just a general prohibition. It must be, it must be open uh, in very limited circumstances. And in my uh, written evidence, you've, you've seen some of the safeguards uh, that I've put in. 
Uh, but in very limited circumstances, these pain compliant techniques ought to be used. Now, whether, of course, pain compliant techniques or non pain compliant techniques are going to be used, the question of de escalation and talk down skills and calming strategies, those types of um, interventions need to be at the forefront of all sorts of the difficulties faced by staff. Uh, frequently, physical intervention techniques are used. There aren't any de-escalation techniques. With de-escalation techniques, in many situations that I've come across, there would have been no need at all for the use of, of physical force. And another thing to bear in mind about uh, de-escalation is it's an ongoing process. It's not a matter of saying, we will try and de-escalate the situation. If de-escalation fails, then we will use uh, some form of restraint. But even if a restraint is being used, it's also important that de-escalation talking skills are used at the same time, so as to reduce the uh, intensity of the situation and to try and reduce the length that a restraint that needs to be used for. Thank you very much indeed. Um, in your written evidence, you make the point that um, re resorting to the use of force would not be tolerated in circumstances outside the secure setting, uh, whereas it happens in similar circumstances within the secure setting. Um, that raises questions about criminal and civil proceedings where force is used on the face of it unlawfully in the secure setting. Can you give some examples of the differences between the use of the of, of restraint in the secure state and compare it with the not secure state? Uh, yes, I, I think because um, uh, people are held uh, securely, um, many uh, staff or many regimes will have it that well, we can restrain people because, because we can. Uh, and that simply can't be tolerated. Now, um, in many cases, we've seen excellent examples of restraint being used absolutely as a last resort, but in too many uh, cases, uh, the restraint is being used when it just shouldn't be used at all, both in, both, uh, uh, in uh, contravention of the rules and the regulations, and as you said, in, uh, in contravention in civil and criminal law. When um, I prepared my talk about um, we recommended that there should be a single certified physical intervention technique um, that should be prepared and certified as it were as being safe for children. Safe for children. Do you regard that as a realistic recommendation? Uh, if, you don't, if you do, can you say how such a technique would best be defined? If you don't, could you give reasons? By technique, uh, do, do you mean a single technique or a, or a range of techniques? Well, a single physical intervention technique that might involve a range of actions. Yes. A, a menu of actions. Well, provided we're talking about a, a menu of actions, uh, I think that there ought to be a single system uh, that could be used across the uh, uh, state. And the reasons for that uh, are that what we've got at the moment is just, I think, a quite ridiculous situation. We've got so many different systems, uh, 10, 12 or more different systems being used across the secure estate. How can that be? How could it be best practice when different people are doing different things? There ought to be a single method of um, controlling uh, violence and aggression with the emphasis on uh, de-escalation of talking strategies, but also with some approved, uh, both medically and from the uh, restraint practitioners' uh, um, bodies, some approved techniques that don't rely upon excessive force, don't rely upon uh, the strength or upon pain, that can bring the situation under control alongside continuous um, de-escalation and talk down skills 